there is time for questions. Okay, the question is about fragmentation of data. So, uh, in the relational database literature, uh, there is something um, called horizontal fragmentation versus vertical fragmentation. What does this mean? Supposing I have a big table like this. Okay, a lot of rows. And then there are columns like this. Maybe lots of columns also. What is horizontal fragmentation? In horizontal fragmentation, the table is broken up into pieces. Let's say there are five machines. This part goes to machine one, machine two, machine three, machine four, and machine five. So this is called horizontal fragmentation. Is this notation clear? This is what Hadoop runs on. It's based extensively on horizontal fragmentation because it breaks up uh, data into files. The files are broken up into lines or what, records or whatever. So that's horizontal fragmentation. In the relational database literature, there is another concept called vertical fragmentation. which can say these two columns are processed at machine one and these two at machine two. Instead of, so I'm breaking up the relation by columns, not by rows. In fact, you can have a combination. I can say that this part is in machine one, this part is in machine two, uh, this part is in machine three, and so on. You can combine horizontal and vertical fragmentation, both. Um, but Hadoop focuses on horizontal, vertical is, in fact, Hadoop has no idea of a schema. All it knows is records. It doesn't know what is inside a record. That part is up to you when you write the map and reduce function to deal with. So Hadoop is very low level. It doesn't know anything about schemas. And that's also the reason it's a pain to program in Hadoop. We just saw a lot of code for doing something very simple. Um, so. It is very nice for many things, but it's a lot of work to do simple things. And that motivates why SQL is making its way back in this community. So there was a period when people said no SQL. The SQL is old. It's, see, we can uh, write programs in Hadoop, which can run at uh, thousands, tens of thousands of nodes. You database people are struggling with the parallel databases running on 200, 300 nodes. Okay, so that's where it started. Uh, no SQL said, forget SQL. But eventually people realized that, sure, you can do it, but it's a lot of work to write programs. And after all that, it's very inefficient. So they said, we can run programs that run on 1,000 machines. Today, the database people are coming back and saying, why are you using 1,000 machines? We can run your programs better on 100 machines. Okay, we don't need 1,000 machines. We write better programs. Our code is better, it's faster. So that's what is happening in the world today. Of course, it's not the original databases. There are other companies which are coming and doing these things. And um, databases in SQL are actually making a comeback. There's a couple more small topics in Hadoop before I move to some other topics here. The first is what is called local pre-aggregation. So I said that each machine outputs all these values, map, each mapper outputs all these values, which are then sent to a reduce function. Supposing that I need to send all this data over a network. That takes a lot of time. You know, if you see the way technology has gone, CPU speeds kept increasing for a long time. Now CPU speeds are not increasing that much, or not at all, but the number of cores per uh, CPU has kept going up. The number of CPUs per machine has gone up. So today it's routine to have uh, you know, 32 cores on a single one uh, single machine with 32 cores. And internally the bandwidth is very nice. 
What about disks? Disk bandwidth has been going up steadily. Uh, it used to be maybe 10 megabytes, 20 megabytes. These days you can get uh, 300 megabytes even from disks. It's gone up a lot. What about network? Network speeds reached one gigabit long ago. All your laptops have gigabit ethernet cards. Um, the servers running at Google probably also have one gigabit ethernet cards. Okay, that's become a big bottleneck. So 10 gigabit ethernet is available, but it's more expensive. I'm sure it is used, but it's still fairly expensive. I don't know why. Networking people have been lazy, maybe. I don't know. But the bottom line is the network is a bottleneck today for many things. So what local pre-aggregation does, it says, wait, why am I sending all this, you know, on my one machine I have processed, say, 100 documents. Can I group together and do a local group by on those 100 documents and output the word count so that each word will go out only once with a count across these 100 documents? That makes sense. Why ship all this stuff across the network and make a bottleneck in the network. So what the combiner does is, you can run it within a machine, you can even run it in another level. Uh, so the way these things are organized, how do you organize a system with a thousand machines? The way you'll do it is, you have a rack, okay, and there is one rack, not very good at 3D drawings. Here's another rack. What does each rack contain? Each rack has a number of machines. This is one machine. Okay, so a typical uh, server these days is called one, it's called one U format. This is a standard unit, which is like uh, about maybe three centimeters or so high. I don't know the exact size, but that's what, three, four centimeters height. So one rack like this about say six feet high, can take about 40 machines, plus some switches on top and a few other things. So this is a typical rack. So within this rack, there is a network switch, and this network switch in turn is connected to another network switch. So each rack has its own network switch. So all the machines here are connected here, and uh, so let's say this switch has 40 connections to the 40 machines, and then one or more connections to the main switch. So typically, this is one gigabit, this is 10 gigabit ports. This is typical. So first of all, you can do pre-aggregation within each machine to avoid overloading the one gigabit links. Then at the rack level, you can have, send all these to one of the machines, which can do another, or, or even that can be parallelized. What it does is, across the 40 machines in the rack, it can do a sum again. So, <coughs> so you don't send out uh, the same word 40 times, but only once with a combined count. So that is the uh, rack level combiner. So within machine and at rack level. So the Hadoop framework lets you define a combiner function, uh, and you can say, use the combiner. You, that's an option you can give it. And then it will run it um, at each machine. And if it knows about the machine layout on the racks, you can also uh, help guide it to run it at each rack level. Uh, in Hadoop, the reduce function, which you define is itself used as a combiner by default if you turn on combiners, or you can specify your own combiner. My suggestion is don't do this. It gets into trouble if you don't know what you're doing. Initially, in, in, in your programming, don't bother about combiners. Afterwards, if you have time, you can play around with it. Okay, so what are the implementations? As I said, uh, Google is not open source. We can't use it. Um, Hadoop is what everybody uses. It's available there. And there are others, Aster data, uh, and so on. And then there are some others uh, which are used in other places. Right? But the Hadoop is today the, the thing. That's why we're using it. So now, uh, I've been mentioning this throughout the talk, MapReduce versus parallel databases. So 
there was a lot of buzz about MapReduce. Then the database people said, but we have been doing this for a long time. The MapReduce people said that, hey, you never ran at such scale, fault tolerance. Where does fault tolerance come in? If you go back to this picture, a lot of map tasks, a lot of reduce tasks. What if the machine running one of the map tasks fails? What to do? The good thing is, no, it's not replicated ahead of time, but the master can detect that this mapper is not generating data or it is dead totally. And the same thing which it gave, which it told this guy to do, it will run it on another machine. The exact same map task will be run on another machine. What about the output of this guy? So this guy's output will not be consumed until it's fully generated. So if it fails in the middle, before its output is consumed, um, it can be thrown away. And the reduce task here will wait for a, a rep, newly created copy of the task to finish before the reduce task start. So the way the thing works is first all the map tasks are run. If a map task doesn't finish, doesn't generate data, it rerun effectively, and only when all the map tasks are done and have sent the data to the reducers is the map phase finished. Meanwhile, the reducers can collect the data, but they don't run the reduce function yet. They wait until all the map tasks are finished, they've got all the data that they need, then they do the final sorting and run the reduce task. What if a reducer fails? No problem. Uh, you can get the data again from the map task here and rerun the reduce task. So again, all of this is done by the master. So even if there are failures, it can recover. In fact, even if a map task doesn't fail, sometimes what happens, it runs slowly. Why? Because that machine may be doing some other task. It became slow. Somebody is uh, running some very uh, intensive job on it. It's become very slow. Even in that case, the master will rerun the map task. So laggards like slow machines can also be compensated. It's not pure failures, but even slowing down can be dealt with. So this is the kind of fault tolerance that it gives. Plus it uses the fault tolerance of the uh, distributed file system itself. Yeah. So failures are nicely handled. And then this was the major thing. Procedural code in map and reduce functions, for example, page rank and so on, can be done in a relational database, but you first have to pre-process the data. That's a lot of work. And all that can be done procedurally. On the other hand, MapReduce is very cumbersome and slow. In fact, execution is slow for very simple tasks, for which SQL is actually a much better fit. And the second part is that programming in MapReduce is very painful. So two things happened in parallel. The first was to provide a better interface to MapReduce for tasks which are more naturally uh, database tasks. And there were three things, uh, systems. One is a system called PIG, also from Yahoo. This one, they didn't public, uh, they didn't open source it, it's internal. Um, and, no, sorry, PIG is open source. There's another one, I'm, I'm mixing it up. PIG is open source, developed at Yahoo. So what? PIG does is it has uh, algebra, essentially, and lets you uh, specify these operations and um, run these on the data. So you, it's predefined a number of operations. You can use those. You don't have to write map jobs from scratch. So it's declarative. Um, then there's Hive, which came from Facebook, which actually lets you run it directly write SQL, uh, a dialect of SQL. And in fact, uh, Hive also uh, specifies a schema for each input source. And so although the data may be in files, Hive knows what is the format of the data and can read the data appropriately. And then the third one is Scope from Microsoft. This is again not publicly uh, available, but I mean, you can purchase it. So th these are three things which allow declarative query, SQL or variants. And then there have been many extensions of MapReduce to allow joins by planning of data. In fact, they have come to the point where they are now like a parallel database implementation with MapReduce extra on it. So there are several such systems that are available. 
So the combination of these, now there's a huge impact now. There are a lot of companies which are building these, some open source, some not. But there's a lot of products out there which some people call this new SQL, which are really massively parallel systems which can run SQL queries directly. So this is for, so far what is MapReduce for? It's for analyzing data. What if you want to store data? What if you want to do transaction processing at really large scale? What can you do? MapReduce is not the answer to that. MapReduce is only for querying. But databases are not only querying. If you know, databases have two aspects. There is the online transaction processing, and then there is the decision support. So far, all we have been talking of in big data is decision support. What about OLTP? In fact, there are systems which do that. And these are called big data storage systems. Again, they started from ground up, meaning the initial systems do very simple jobs. They don't do a lot. In fact, um, all that they do is they're called key value stores. Anyway, look at, look, looking at the history for it, uh, you need to store huge amounts of data. You need scalability. Distributed file systems, which are un underlying Hadoop, have been around. But the problem is that they assume each file is very big. Uh, GFS, HDFS will die if you throw one billion files at them. They just cannot handle that kind of scale. They can handle uh, hundreds of thousands of very large files, maybe millions of very large files but not billions. But a lot of data which comes from uh, data processing application is very small. Each piece of data is small. And then you have billions of such data. So take an example, Facebook. What kind of data does Facebook generate? Each time somebody posts a comment, it's data. Each time someone posts a photo, it's data. Each time somebody clicks on like, it's a piece of data. Each data is really small. It identifies who clicked it, whose page it was on, time, few other things. And this number of such things that are generated are huge, absolutely huge. What about the friends thing? Each person has friends on Facebook. How many friends does the average person have? I don't know, maybe a few hundred. So that data is also pretty small. It's not very big. But there are billions of users on Facebook. So if Facebook tried to store all its data uh, uh, you know, per user file is created on um, GFS or HDFS, it would die. It cannot these systems cannot handle so many files. So what happened, again, the history is, um, again, Google took the lead in this. It built a system called Bigtable, which is built on top of Google file system. So underneath it is creating a, a fewer number of large files. Each file is like a few hundred megabytes. But within those files, it stores much smaller records. And the primary interface is you can put a record with a key. You can retrieve a record for a given key. And then you can scan all records in a given key range. Just three operations. Well, there are a few minor ones, but these are the three main ones. Put a record with a key, get a record with a key, range scan. Now, what do you do with these three operations? They actually, you can do a lot with just these three primitives. So a lot of applications are built on exactly this kind of infrastructure. Uh, it's very powerful, actually. It is not a full-fledged relational database. Why? There's no notion of integrity constraints. There's no notion of, well, there is an equivalent of relation. Uh, but full-fledged integrity constraints are not there. Uh, you. If you want SQL, you need one more layer. They don't provide SQL. Uh, they don't provide transactions. They don't provide concurrency control. They don't provide many things. What they do provide is scale, which the traditional databases don't at that level. So these have been used extensively. First, Bigtable from Yahoo, and uh, soon enough, Yahoo, uh, sorry, Bigtable from Google. And soon enough, Yahoo came up with its own version called Peanuts. This one they did not open source. It's internal. Uh, but more recently, um, the Hadoop project has also built something called HBase, which is a clone of Bigtable. 
Uh, so that's also available. Uh, we are not doing anything with it in this course. But if you have students who want to do something new with uh, the latest tools, HPS is a nice thing to try out. So we have had several student projects in IIT this year using HPS. So what is the key value store? As I said, you have two main operations. Put a key with an associated value, get key, and then maybe range scans. And the system may store potentially multiple versions of data with a timestamp. Very simple interface. How is it implemented? Um, this is a schematic com which comes from the Peanuts system from Yahoo. So what you have are what are called tablets. Why tablets? This has nothing to do with medicines. It's a piece of a table. Okay, so. Like a piece of a cigar is a cigarette, a piece of a table is a tablet. Okay. So you break up tables horizontally into a lot of pieces and store them across many nodes. And now note that these boxes here are machines. Each machine contains many tablets. It's not one tablet per machine. It's potentially hundreds of tablets per machine. Why? Because it gives flexibility. Supposing this machine is overloaded. There's a lot of demand on tablets in this machine. What do you do? You can move one tablet from here to here, or two tablets, or some small number of tablets, and rebalance the load. Or you can uh, you know, purchase a new machine and put it in, and then take one tablet each from each of these machines and stick it into the new machine. That way you have grown the system by one machine. Without seriously affecting the work on these machines. Each is copying out a small amount of data. Each tablet is typically a few hundred megabytes. Okay, so that's how the data is partitioned. And now, what about queries? If a request comes in, you have to know where, which tablet contains data and where that tablet resides. Okay, so there is a index kept here at the master copy of that index is here at the tablet controller. And then there are machines called routers which have a copy of that uh, information. So given a key value, this can look up that index and say this, by the way, the index is uh, on ranges. So any key value between one and 20,000 is in this thing, or hash of key value equal to something is on this machine. Okay, so that's how that goes. So this, uh, partition uh, and tablet mapping, this thing is actually fairly small. It fits in memory. Although the data is huge, the mapping is small. So given a key value, I know which tablet it is in, and I know where that tablet resides quickly. I can find that out. And then the query is sent to the appropriate tablet. Now what about replication? Well, the master also keeps track of tablet replicas. Updates have to be sent to all the replicas. Um, so I've not shown that in this figure, but that's how this system works. And big table is also essentially the same architecture, although some details differ. And here, how is each tablet managed? In peanuts, these tablets are stored as relations in a MySQL database or in a Berkeley DB store. In big table, they've built their own infrastructure for storing tablets, uh, which is highly optimized for writes. They have some interesting techniques there. So that's the underlying system. So again, uh, you can't get peanuts or Bigtable, but HBase is a clone of Bigtable. It also uses a similar architecture. So uh, I'd encourage you to get your students to do some projects with these. So many, many companies are taking to this. Uh, so coming back, why are companies bothered about it now? Who, who cares, right? 30 years back, it was only Walmart, or 20 years back, it was only Walmart, and a few other companies, AT&T. Then the web came, and many companies, Yahoo, uh, Amazon, uh, maybe Flipkart, Rediff, many companies have websites. But if only these companies were interested in uh, these technologies, again, it's a small market. Well, what is happening is, every company today is interested in you know, when people are searching for their products on the net, they want to know about it. They want to know who is searching. 
and they want to advertise, so, so that is another side. But the search companies will happily sell information about who searched for what, and companies will buy that data. There's a lot of data which is available to be bought, and they want to use that data, analyze it, to make decisions. So even companies which don't even operate a major website have a huge amount of data, and they're analyzing it. So there's a lot of opportunities in the job market in this area. So it's good to have students look at it, at least the more advanced students. So time for a few questions. If the uh, size of the tabular coordinator is large, then how we can manage the access time for a tablet coordinator? Which one? This one? Of course, the sir. Tablet coordinator, suppose size of the tablet coordinator. The master copy or the router? Yeah, or? yeah master copy, sir. Yeah. So the, the, there is a, a, so supposing you have a tablet which is 100 megabytes. Let's say you have a petabyte of data. How many tablets are there? Right? So 100 megabytes, a gigabyte is 10 tablets. A terabyte is 10,000 tablets. A petabyte is 10 million tablets. So now you have to store information for 10 million tablets. But what is it that you need to store? You need some hash function and boundaries and so on. 10 million can easily be stored in memory. That's nothing. OK, so it's very easy to fit this in the memory of one machine. Does that answer your question? If size increases day by day, yeah. so even, OK, I think your point is eventually this is going to become very big. Then what? That's a good question. So this is an engineering decision that people have taken today. Today, with the memory sizes that are available, scaling to a petabyte is easy. And the biggest things that are out there today are a few petabytes, three, four petabytes. That's nothing. Three petabytes is 30 million entries. 30 million entries, supposing we put 20 bytes for each entry, or even 50 bytes for each entry, 1.5 gigabytes, nothing. It's small. OK, so as an engineer, you'd say that for now, this is good enough. Maybe five years from now, when it has gone to five times this, Maybe we need to rethink this. In fact, this has already happened, not for Bigtable, but for GFS. GFS has been re-engineered. Uh, GFS also did something like this. It stored, um, there's a master which tracks which blocks or which files are on which machine. That runs into trouble when you have more than a, a 100 million files. So, like I said, uh, 30, 50 million tablets, 100 million files, there is some comparison here. 50 million tablets is fine, 100 million files is fine, but if you go to a billion files, they die. Now, you don't need to go to a billion tablets because tablets are under your control. Even if the records are small, you are grouping many records into a tablet. For GFS, it's not in their control. If an application comes and creates a billion files, GFS will die. So GFS has been re-architected. Uh, they have a new system called Colossus, I think, which is uh, different. They're, this uh, master information here is spread across multiple machines, and it can handle much larger sizes. OK, so the question is, what is this request to tablet mapping? OK, I think I skipped something here. I didn't tell you what is a request. A request is a get or put call, which we just saw. It's not a web request, not at all. It's put a key and a value pair, or get key, or maybe range scan. So the request is specifying a key value or a range of key values. And this mapping, the router, says that this particular key value is at this tablet. So that, that is done in some range partitioning or hash partitioning of some kind. Uh, and that needs to have essentially uh, one range per tablet. And so the, that's why I said about, say, 50 bytes per tablet is enough. OK, good. Uh, so now we'll have a coffee break here.